Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the Amsterdam Public Library, Amsterdam, New York, 25th of February 2005, approximately 1.30 p.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? William Rosa, uh, September 13th, 1918. Okay, what was oh, your... Atlantic City, New Jersey. All right, that's... Uh, on the way there. Uh, what was your educational background when you... High school. When you entered... Okay. That's all. Do you remember where you were and your uh, reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes. Um, I, I was... It was Sunday. I was sitting in the house reading a paper, Sunday paper, and all of a sudden over the, te not television, we didn't have television then, uh, over the radio, um, uh, all of a sudden they said Pearl Harbor was bombed. Mm -hmm. okay? And um, the president come on and um, said, uh oh, we're in trouble now. So. I was working in the GE at the time as a gear cutter operator. I had been working there about a year mm -hmm. before the war broke out. And um, all the time, all the time uh, I was working there, um, the um, GE was able to give me a deferment because of the, the um, type of work I was doing, mm -hmm. see. And, uh, well, it, that didn't last long because in February 24th, no, in February 1st, I think it was, our foreman came to all of us and he says, I can't defer you anymore. You've got you to gotta report to your um, draft board. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did, and, and on 20, uh, February 24th, I um, I left Gloversville for um, oh, I I think we now this see this is where I, I forget something That's I right. think we went to the railroad station in Fonda and from there we went to uh, Camp Dix. Now did you enlist or were you drafted? Drafted. Drafted. Okay. Yeah. I was married and I had one child oh, okay. at the time. See. <clears throat> so. And we went to we went to Fort Dix in New Jersey. We stayed there, I think, about a week. And we were shipped off to Camp Walters, Texas. That's in uh, Mineral Wells, just outside of Mineral Wells, Texas. And my basic training was at at um, Camp Walters. Uh, and several several local boys also had their basic training down there too, and that was for 17 weeks. I came back from uh, when the basic training was over. They gave us a weekend pass. That's the first weekend pass we had in, a, in uh, 17 weeks. And of course, I had been in the National Guards for three years before this. Oh, okay. So I, I knew everything. In fact, they made me an acting corporal down there all the time I was there. Uh, but they wouldn't give me corporal stripes. They, they just made me an acting corporal. And um, um, I, uh, we were given that three-day furlough. We went into town, Fort Worth, and and. Oh, we've done a little drinking and like that, you know, like the fellows do. And um, I met a, a, a fellow from um, Utica that was in our outfit, and, uh, Matt Oskowski, his name was. And him and I kind of buddied right together all the time. <clears throat> and then we, we came home. And we had, um, I, I, I believe it was a week's furlough, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. I, I can't say for sure, but it, it seems to me it was uh, a week's furlough. And they were, we were supposed to report to uh, uh, Fort Meade. 
And um, in fact, I, I took my wife down with me, even. And um, we spent a day in New York, and I, and Matt brought his wife with him. Mm -hmm. We kind of enjoyed each other's company. And uh, then we went on to uh, ourselves, we went on to Fort Meade. And um, uh, of course, we had all our clothes, duffel bags, and they were, we were told to throw them in the big pile over on the side there. We was issue all brand new clothes. Mm -hmm. Now, where did your wife live while you were in service? She lived home. Okay. She lived home. Okay. Uh, uh, some of the fellows brought their wives down there to Mineral Wells. Um, but I, one fellow had his wife there and he was living in a dump. And I said, no way, I, can, I can, just okay. can't do it. I got, you're better off, she's better off staying home, see. Mm -hmm. So, um, I see now, where was I? Um, you, you reported to me. Yeah, yeah. We was issued all new clothing and and um, I think it was, <coughs> we were there maybe two, three days. And then um, we got our orders to ship out and we went on a, a three stacker uh, boat and we were supposed to join another a group of boats out of New York and Boston, I think, uh, out out at sea, and there was a whole convoy that went. Mm -hmm. We had destroyers on our sides and like that. And uh, it was an enjoyable cruise over, I would say. There was no no heavy weather or anything, and in fact, half the time we was up on deck playing cards or doing something like that. See? And... Um, we landed in Glasgow, Scotland, and it was funny to see the Scottish people. Uh, one fellow threw an orange over over the side of the boat because we're way up, maybe 50 feet in the air, and the Scottish people caught the orange. So all the, all the servicemen on the on the boat were throwing these oranges over, and of course the Scottish people they probably couldn't get oranges, you know, mm -hmm. and we had all the oranges we wanted. But it, it uh, seemed funny how they, and I couldn't understand them uh, as we went down the gangplank and went onto the train. I couldn't understand their lingo. They're, they talked different than mm -hmm. we did, see. And uh, we uh, we got on, a, on a, a train and we traveled south to, uh, not quite to Southampton, but we weren't too close to London, but we were, say, in between London and Southampton, there was a, uh army camp there, mm -hmm. and we stayed there two nights. And then we shipped out of uh, Southampton across the um, canal, or not the canal, what do they, what do they call it? The channel. The channel. The channel, across the English Channel. And we were two days going across there, and the weather was rougher than hell, and... Um, the uh, the first night we had, I think it was pork to eat. Well, everybody got sick on that boat. Everybody. They all had dysentery. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't imagine the picture that uh, as the night grew on later and later during the night, there was no place to go to the bathroom. So the fellows were doing it right on the floor, anywhere. They were doing it anywhere yeah, because they had to do it. And um, the next morning we all reported to uh, sick bay and, and they gave us something, but it seemed to clear it up right away because uh, I don't remember having any trouble the next day. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, landed, uh, we landed over in Omaha Beachhead, and uh, they made us go over the side. Of course, this is, now wait a minute. I forgot to tell you, this is probably um, around the 1st of August, sometime in there. It was either the last week in July or the first week in August, sometime in that area. And uh, of course, D Day was all over with and everything. And 
We was there evidence on the beach though? Could oh yes, see? yes, yes. There's still evidence of a lot of stuff on the beach. Mm -hmm. see? We went in just like they did at D Day. Mm -hmm. We had to go over and down the ropes and with our full packs on and rifles and everything down at mm -hmm. ropes and jump into the uh, what is LSTs? Are they um, landing crafts? Yeah, landing yeah. crafts yeah. and 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 then we and we they got us close to the beach as we can. We had to jump in the water up knee deep and and then walk on up and we walked on up the the they by that time they had a they had a regular runway up oh, up okay, the right. side of the the hill. But uh, on D-Day, I know they they didn't have that yeah. runway. So we got I got up to top, and um, a very impressive thing uh, at the top was a a cemetery as as, as far as the eyes can see. And it, uh, crosses, white crosses, and of course it kind of made me think, see, and we, we walked on, we walked on quite a ways, and, and, uh, <clears throat> I'd forgotten maybe five, six miles, something like that. And then trucks picked us up and took us further on, and we kept right on going across. Now, the, were you assigned to a unit or were you a replacement? Only a replacement. That, replacement. That's coming up, and it's okay. going to, I'm going to put it in. I hope that the Pentagon hears it too. Okay. Because that was the, the worst thing they could ever done to a man. We went into a replacement depot. And that was between um, it was west of Nancy, but it was east of um, oh the city was bombed bombed right out completely. Um, can't think of the name of it right now, but it's in that other movie. Um, we went into this replacement depot, and they had nurses in there. They had the army men in there. They had sailors in there too. I, what the heck are the sailors doing here? You know. And of course, the only thing we could do was just amuse ourselves. We played cards, and I got into a poker game, and I won so much money I didn't know what I. I had my pocket. All my pockets were full of money. Uh, and then all of a sudden. Matt, Matt said to me, he says, Bill, I'm broke. They're calling me up. I said, I know, i got to go tomorrow, too. I says, here, you can have some money. I reached in my pocket. I gave him everything in the pocket. So he would have some money. And, um, um, he went to the 80th, and I went to the uh, 35th division. And um, we went in at night. I didn't know a soul. I didn't know my own sergeant. I didn't even know the guy next to me. I didn't know nobody. I didn't know what, where they were going, what they were doing, or anything. And a guy standing over on the side, he says, you better start to dig it. Uh, slit trench because they're they're bombarding us now. I says I can hear that, and so we did. And um, <coughs> and I, I I dug mine uh, not too deep, but I I got down <coughs> into it. Threw the helmet over my head. I says, so be it. If I'm gone, I'm gone. Well, luckily I I got through it. A couple of fellows were killed, but uh, you know that's that was life then. And uh, the next morning we got up, we had breakfast, and um, they issued us a bunch of uh, of uh, K rations. I put them in my pack, 
and we started out. We started out, and um, we weren't very far from the German lines then. And um, all of a sudden, a, a sniper was starting to pick us off one at a time, and uh, the lieutenant said to A, so-and-so, go get that sniper. He says, you want that sniper? Go get him yourself. I'm not going to expose myself to him. And we were all down hiding and like that, and behind trees. And, and um, finally somebody did get him. And then we went on, went, went on uh, down. And somebody saw a German running. He pulled his 45. Oh, you ever ever see a 45 knock a man down? It flipped him right over. And I thought to myself, boy, that's a powerful weapon. I can get a hold of one of them. I'm going to get one. Well, anyway, right after that, we were starting to go up the hill. And here's a trench. A German trench had been dug six foot deep, too. And so we, had, we started to get fire from, from the trees up above. And we jumped down into those, um, into those trenches. There's where I met my sergeant. He was right next to me. He had just returned from being wounded um, three or four weeks before. And he says, I don't like this. We're in their trenches. They can, they can blow us right out of here. And um, so he says, keep your heads down. Everybody keep your heads down. And uh, so we did. We did. And then all of a sudden he stuck his head up and bang. They caught him right in the side of his head. Right here, it killed him there. Then somebody else got shot a little bit off to his right. And then somebody else got shot. And I, I, I yelled to some of the fellows, I said, what do you think we ought to do? I said, they're picking us off one at a time. We can't stick our heads up, we can't go nowhere. We're stuck right here. And then they started throwing these grenades. They're little, little like an egg. And they start rolling them down the hill, and they roll, and they roll right down into the ditch, and they and then they explode. When I'm exploding, that's where I got it in my arm and my uh, my leg, uh, um, a shell fragment. How long you, had you been in combat? <laughs> maybe a week, maybe about a week. Was this your first action? Yes, yeah, it was the first action we had. Uh, oh, wait a minute, I got, I got, I got. I got ahead of myself. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, we we joined that 35th Division beef on the west side of Nancy, and as we were marching through Nancy, we marched through Nancy because they declared it a um, um, city like they did Paris. You know, okay. the Germans didn't bomb it, and Americans didn't bomb it. They left it intact. But as we were marching through Nancy. All of a sudden, I see from the light light poles there. Here's a woman hanging from the light pole with her head all shaved, and then all of a sudden, the next light pole there was another woman hanging with the, her head all shaved. And I said to the fellow next to me, I said, "What, what, uh, what's that?" Uh, and, well, he says they're collaborators with the Germans, and they slept with the Germans and like that, and and. Um, uh, the French people did it to them, so, and uh, so we went on, we went on from there, and it was just on the outside of Nancy is where we got into this uh, trouble, see, and, and uh, uh, now getting back to where I was in the trenches, um, I, 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 you know, I think there was eight of us left in the, in the whole squad, and um, I, I yelled to the fellows, what do you think we ought to do? We can't just stay here all the time. They're going to they're gonna pick us off one at a time, anything we do. Because they were above us high enough, so if we just got our head just above the, the, the ditch, they could see us right away. And uh, one fellow says, well, let's surrender. Uh, well, if it's agreeable with the rest of you, it's all right with me. So we did. We decided to. So we put up the white flag, and lo and behold, down at the left side of me, here's three Germans. They jump up right away, come right up the ditch, and start to disarm us and like that. 
and take us out of the ditch and walked us, um, I would say about a thousand, mile, a thousand yards uh, to a house, farmhouse. And uh, they made us sit down on benches just inside the door that came in. We sat there for a while and, and the officer would call this one in and that one in like to interview them, uh, you know, um, want to know their outfit they're belonging to and everything like that. And we all told them the same thing. But while we were sitting there, one um, German soldier came in. He laid his machine gun down against the wall right next to me. Right, I was sitting here, and he laid that machine gun right there. And I said, Shelley or Shana? Now, if I was single, I would have picked it up, and I'd sprayed everything I could find. But then I got to thinking, now I'm married, if that thing hasn't got any cartridges in, I'm dead. I said, no, I won't take that chance. So, uh, what I'm trying to say is, a single man will do things a married man won't do. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we all got interviewed, and uh, we... I, I did. I was the one that said it. I said it to the lieutenant. I says, you know, and I know we got our sergeant out there in the, in the ditch. And I said, at least can we give him a, a decent burial. He said, yeah, I'll take two or three guys out there and get him and, and bury him up, up above here. And so we did. We took his dog tags over and we put a cross on, on a grave and put the dog tags and put his rifle and upside down in there with his helmet on top. And um, the, late that afternoon, we got in some um, German trucks, and they started to take us back of the lines. And um, uh, we must have drove at least 25 miles anyway. And here I'm looking at the side of the side of the road here. Here's American. Um, uh, third Army, Third Armored Division, tanks, all blown to hell. And the guys are laying over the dead, and some of them laying down on, the, on um, where Patton had gone on through, and he circles around and comes back, see. But uh, dead horses, we, oh, geez. it was a sight, you know, it was a sight that we've never seen in our own own life at home, see. Mm -hmm. So the first night we stopped in a in a schoolhouse, and uh, they gave us some uh, soup and a slice of bread for that day. Of course, we didn't have our K rations. They took our packs away from us and everything. <laughs> I had 14 cartons of cigarettes <laughs> in my in my backpack, so. So I wouldn't run out of cigarettes, you know. But uh, they get that's that's what they fed us: soup and soup and uh, and bread. And then the next morning we started to go down this road, and we noticed on each tree the trees were all lined on the side of the road. Each tree had a dynamite strapped to the side of it, and. Um, I said, look at that, fellas. They're going to dynamite those trees and, and make a make a, um, a barrier so the, the tanks can't get up through through there. See, and uh, of course it, we we got on through, but uh, I don't know that was for future use. See, and um, them they took us up in. I don't know the name of the town, but it was close to Frankfurt, and it was uh, Stalag's 12A, I think it was. And um, there we were uh, and, uh, deloused. I thought my end was there. I thought they were going to gas us. But we were deloused instead. And uh, they made us take all our clothes off and, and they put the clothes in the delousing and they put us through the delousing. They shaved all the hair off our heads and all the hair off our uh, privates. And um, then, then we went on and we 
got our clothes and we dressed ourselves and went out the other end of the building. And then they they gave us dog tags, um, and and uh, we were assigned to a um, a barrack, so we went to the barracks there, and that was only temporary. And, and the, the sergeant that was in charge of the barracks, he told us, he says, you'll only be here for about a couple of days, and then you're going to move on. Lord knows where you'll go. You may go. You may go to Poland, you may go to Austria, you may go to uh, Munich, and so we, that's, he was right, we got up that third morning and we went, uh, we went out and walked over to the train and we got on these boxcars and boy they packed us right in like sardines. And um, we started up, it was toward Berlin, there was a camp up by Berlin and and um, they were going to put us in there but when we got up there uh, there was no room there was no room and so we had they had to turn us around and and we went back and then we went towards Munich and uh, we we stopped in a, a little town uh, called Moosburg and uh, we called it Landshut land shit and see it's spelled just exactly the way you pronounce it and um, but Mooseburg was the town that the camp was 7a land shit and um, on the way to this camp we were strafed by our own plane several times oh we were lucky there was only maybe four or five fellows got shot in, 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 in the strafing and at one time they um, stopped the train and they let us all get out and get down in the ditches so that we could protect ourselves and they could protect them. See the, there was two so German soldiers with every box guard so um, they were thinking of them not us mm -hmm. I think. And um, well, we got into um, we got into the camp, and we got in there, and we got settled. We got in our barracks, and uh, we, you know, met this fellow and that fellow. Met met a lot of. I had a list of every single man in our our compound in a book, YMCA book that it was given to me, and and uh, their addresses and everything. But um, that disappeared, and I, I wished I had it today. We had a stove in that in that uh, barracks, but we didn't have anything to fuel it with. We had to uh, we had to go out to work every single morning. We'd go into Munich. That was our destination, Munich. It was about an hour's train ride to Munich. And then an hour back at night, but we were always secondary. We uh, other other trains had to right away. We didn't. We had to be secondary. So um, we'd bring back what we could find and sticks and everything like that. And of course, everybody could use that stove to to cook on or whatever they wanted to do on it. You know, and. Um, we was given we, we we never received breakfast in the morning like the Americans re always eat breakfast you know most most Americans do um, but uh, and noon time we'd get the noon time uh, lunch in Munich which would be a, a bowl of soup and maybe a, a, a slice of bread and and then it, when we get back to camp you get a bowl of soup and a slice of bread. Sometimes they would give you uh, maybe a slice of, of they give you a, a package of Lindberger cheese about six inches long and maybe three three inches wide and we'd have to divide that among eight fellows and of course that doesn't leave very much mm -hmm. and Lindberger <laughs> till you get it past your nose <laughs> you're uh, 
you're, um, it's kind of tough to eat, so. Did you ever get any Red Cross packages? Uh, no, not at first. Not at first. That, that I was getting to. Uh, so, we we did this. Now, this is, this, I'm, I'm sure I spent my, my birthday, which is September 13th, I spent that in the, in Munich, in, in. Now, what kind of work were you required to do? Well, you know, the planes went over Munich, and they, the, the, the tracks go into Munich, and the tracks come out, just like in St. Louis, mm -hmm. see, and, and they used to, and there used to be these bridges going across every so far apart, and they, the, the planes would come over and they'd bomb, try to bomb the bridges and bomb out the tracks at the same time, see? And uh, of course it'd be a big, greater, bigger, bigger than this, bigger than this room. And they put a hundred of us around that and we shoveled dirt into it. We wouldn't shovel it very fast, but we'd, mm -hmm. we'd make believe we was doing it, see? And, uh, and somehow they, they, they supply the dirt for us, but, uh, uh, and then we'd have to lay the lay the wooden wooden uh, ties, and then lay the track back, and uh, we done we put it back in shape the way it was. See, and um, but that was our main main goal. Once in a while, they'd use us in in something else, like cleaning up the station uh, where it got bombed. See, and. Uh, because people were still going in and out of on on plane on on trains there, and well, we I worked September and October, and then the I see the I think it was the first of November, they they called for volunteers. I said, oh, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I didn't know what it was, and. Um, the sergeant said, hey, this is a good job. You go into the city and you live in there. You stay right in there for 30 days and you work for uh, independent uh, people. I said, okay, I'll take a chance on it. And we did. It, it was good. I, I got to know a German, a German sergeant and a, and a German uh, PFC. Uh, and I got to know him very good. And, and uh, we got along good. And... Um, we we went in there and every every day they would take us they'd take a whole wagon load of the fellows, there was thirty of us, and drop they drop and me and another fellow off in one place and they drop a two off here and two off somewhere else. And I worked in the, the rail yards there in Munich, uh, where the where the uh, freight cars were and we used to shovel potatoes into hundred pound bags. The other fellow would hold the bag, and I'd shovel them in, and then we'd we'd take the hundred-pound bags and put them on the on another wagon, which two Frenchmen were kind of our bosses. Mm -hmm. They were slave labor. See. Everything was slave labor in in Munich. Everything. Mm -hmm. There was you you didn't see any Germans working. It was and mostly. How, how did the population uh, treat you guys? Uh, they, uh, I'll tell you in a few minutes. Um, uh, the one night <laughs> we just didn't get back to the rail yards in time for the wagon to pick us up so they went on it. They left us there. And we didn't know where we lived. Mm -hmm. We actually didn't know where we lived. And uh, the Frenchman went up into the, uh, the tower, the switching tower there, and asked uh, the guy up there if he knew where the prisoners were living, and he told them. He said, "Put them on a put them on a trolley out here, and and tell them tell the trolley uh, man to uh, to uh, drop them off on a certain corner. And all they got to do is walk half a dozen feet, and, and they're at that schoolhouse. See? And um, uh, so when we got on that trolley." Here's all, you know, fellows and girls and husbands and wives, and they're all happy and gay. And they saw us there. We had our, we had, we were marked as prisoners on our back. And and uh, but we stood at the front of the front of the trolley, 
and uh, but they didn't they didn't um, bother us at all, and uh, you know just as if hey we were we were a part part of uh, if you could talk German you could you could blend right in with the with the German people and they'd never know it they would never know it see and uh, so we we did get back to our our schoolhouse and we walked in the front door and the sergeant said where you guys been I said well we were late in getting back to them to the because we had so many deliveries we had to make well he says uh, gee whiz uh, he says I missed you and I thought something happened to you and uh, well and he was he was very kind to us that sergeant was and uh, during the time that that um, we had to stay there in that schoolhouse his town was bombed, and he says, "I'm going to leave you boys, and you all know where you go, and you know you know what to do." And I got, I'm going to leave this other PFC here with you, and, and uh, he'll take care of all of you. And uh, so he did, and he went home back to his town. He found his town all all blown to hell, and his, of course, he, he his mother and father were all right, so they that's what he went back for. See. Then he came back, but he had no ill feelings against us. And so um, I think it was just before Thanksgiving Day that he said to me, he said, well, you know, you fellas are uh, you're getting down to the end of your time here because you've got to go back by the 30th of um, November. He says, "Do you have you got any money on you?" I said, "Yeah, I think most of the fellows have." And uh, he says, "Well, he says I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take you over here to a gin mill, and he says uh, I'll get you a, a, a half a keg, and he says you but you got to pay for it." I said, "Okay." And so we got a wagon. We took the wagon over and put. And the woman opened the door like a sliding door, and, and and he said something to her, and she says, "Good, bring him in here." And she gave us a half a beer, and we gave her the money for it. I forgot now how much, but uh, it was so many marks, you know. And and we carried it out and put it in a wagon. We lugged it back to the to the um, um, schoolhouse, and all the fellows. All the fellows had uh, cups because we we made our own cups. See, they took away our cups and our mm -hmm. our um, um, canteen and like that. So we made our own cups out of any kind of a can. It didn't matter what size can it was, but we made made it with a handle on it. See, in the in the prison camp, and. Um, uh, so uh, they tapped they tapped the beer and everybody got one cup of beer that night. We were all drunk. Every one of us were drunk. We on one can of beer. Well, I couldn't believe it. And uh, of course, nobody got hurt or anything like that. And and uh, but it was it was a nice gesture on the sergeant's part to do something like that. And um, so. From there, a couple of days later, we had to go back to camp, and then they bring in 30 new ones, see, to take our place. Because they didn't want us to stay there too long, see, because we get familiar with the, with the ropes and everything like that, see. Because even the Frenchmen, when we go and deliver these potatoes around, see, they go into the grocery store, and they they would the Frenchman would say to the woman behind the counter, he says, "These are American prisoners of war. They haven't eaten in quite a while. Give them something to eat." And and the girl the girl would take us back in their kitchen right behind the meat counter, and they'd they'd slice a great big slice of bread off and put some meat in between it, you know. Mm -hmm. And they they were really they were good to us that way, see. And um, so, at one time, the Frenchman took us over to a bar room while we was working there, and, and we got a beer. We got a beer for lunch, you know. And then he he said, "Don't don't say anything to your guard that I did this." See, 
because they were slave labor and they they could go and come as they pleased. They they lived somewhere. I don't know where they lived, but uh, all I know they were slave labor. See, mm -hmm. and um, but we finished our tour there and we went back to camp and then we went back on the old routine at um, going into town every day, day in and day out. And it was, you know, you're up before uh, daylight. You had to go to the train and get into the train, and 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 then you'd work until almost dark, and then you you get back in the train and come back uh, home. But we was always delayed. Sometimes an hour, two hours, either getting there or coming back. See. And sometimes we were straight on the way, see, with plane, our plane, see. And um, this this kept up for quite a while. And one day, one day we went into into uh, Munich, and there was an air raid. Usually, the air raid was always at twelve o'clock, just when they were supposed to feed us. But we. The air raid would last maybe two hours, and so then they wouldn't feed us at noon time. So we'd have to go without food, and sometimes we'd start to scrounge in the garbage pails around the around the the um, the uh, depot, uh, you know, because there was restaurants in the depot. See, and and uh, if we could get anywhere near those garbage pails, if there was food in it, we'd eat it. Didn't matter whether it was maggots in it or not, we'd eat it. Because we were, the first three months were the hardest, hardest part of the deal. And, and then you got used to not eating too much, and so you didn't need too much, see. And so this, this one day, this one day, as we, as the air raid sound, the, the guard said, come on, we got to go over this shelter over here. We went over there and there was somebody at the door and they said, this is all full, you can't come in here. Go down to the other shelter. All right, so we went down to the other shelter. We got into that one. And um, when the air raid was over, we had to come back. We come back by that shelter, and that shelter had a direct hit. Killed everybody in it. So God was with us that day. And... Uh, and we went back to work on a, on on the railroad, and then you could see you could see the damage those bombs bombs did. They blew blew the bridges, and one 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 bridge I saw a motor from a, from the plane um, hanging off the edge of the bridge. And somebody must have shot the motor right out of the right out of the right out of the B B twenty four, and and so they. They really done a lot of damage, and it's luckily that none of us got killed, you know. And um, uh, one day we went into Munich. Instead of going on the railroad, they had bombed a, a prison that they were keeping political prisoners in. The whole wall was all. <coughs> so they, they, we had to lay up that wall with um, cement and brick. Uh, lay it back up where it was where it was bombed out, and uh, these political prisoners, uh, we still was able to get cigarettes. Uh, you know, different ways. You had to you had to be a conniver to do it, but you could get cigarettes either from the guards or or uh, you. The Russians seemed to have cigarettes because they were in our compound too. We had all nationalities in the compound, and um, we'd throw a cigarette out, and oh, 20, 20 of those political prisoners would jump on that cigarette and kill themselves for it, you know? And, um, of course, it, it was funny to us, but it wasn't funny to them, see, to see what a man would do for a cigarette, you know? And, um, well, anyway, we worked there a couple of days because... Um, we got it only halfway the first day, and then the next day we got it all the way up. And <clears> then <throat> we we went back to camp that day, and um, we we kept that routine up every day, going into into Munich, into Munich all the time. 
And uh, finally, let's see now, uh, January, February, March, April. I think it was, I, I, I think, it was either the 1st of March or the 15th of March, somewhere's in there, that um, it was after the, after the Battle of the Bulge, which we knew were, was going to happen on Thanksgiving Day. Because the sergeant in the in the schoolhouse told us they were going to have a have a um, 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 what do they call it? Um, they were going to advance uh, in Belgium against the United States forces, and and uh, he says that's that's going to start sometime just before Christmas. See, well, it was after that uh, they they must have taken an awful lot of prisoners in the Battle of the Bulge because. We got an influx of 50,000 50, men, and we, we had about 100,000 men in our camp then. And you put 50,000 more, you, you, you're bulging at the seams, you're sleeping two in a bed. So um, we, we, uh, we stood it for, oh, I guess, as I say, it's about the 1st of March, and then uh, they said they were going to move 50,000 of us because we had been there the longest. So they moved us, and that next morning we got up, we got all our belongings, what, what we had collected. I had a stove. I had made a, a, a stove in which you could cook a, a, a cup of water on uh, with just one stick of wood. Uh, it had a fan, and it, it kind of blew the blew the the um, uh, the flame, so it would keep that fire going, and and you could you could um, heat up a cup of water or or anything you wanted to. Uh, uh, you could even toast bread on it, but you had to be a little careful with that. Now you made this yourself. And, oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, well, all us guys made made. Because we had to see, mm -hmm. to, uh, wood was so scarce. Uh, even even in the uh, as we used to go along in the in in the boxcars with the doors open, you could look through the forest. You could you could look for miles underneath the forest where people had trimmed up six foot, just as clear, not a twig, not a branch, nothing. Didn't like our woods. Theirs was, because their trees were, these were so high, and the next ones were so high, and the next ones were so high, and the next ones were so high. See, they pre-planted them and like that. And they, uh, uh, wood was a scarcity then. And and uh, so one guy came up with this idea of making a little fan and, and, a, and a, a wheel with a, with a rope around it, and and you could blow and blow that, blow that, and put a piece of paper in there, put a stick on it. You could start that stick, see? and uh, so we use. I got that together. I got I got my utensils that I had made, and uh, I got that um, wham sheet book with all the with all the um, names and addresses of of the different fellows that I was acquainted with in that camp. I was acquainted with a fellow from South Africa who spoke at least seven languages fluently because he was the camp interpreter of the whole camp. When the when the commandant said something, he would say it in English, he'd say it in French, he'd say it in Russian, he'd say it in Polish, he'd say it in Italian, and we had all kinds of all kinds of. Um, uh, nationalities in the camp and um, we all we got out of the camp and we 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 started to march and I don't know how many miles we marched it was probably around 10 below zero then and we we had to march I thought it was halfway to doomsday <laughs> to tell you the truth it got everything got heavy we kept shedding things off I don't need this I don't need that and that book it was in my in the back of my pants back here, so I didn't have to carry it. 
And I, I said, that's too heavy. I'm going to throw that away. I don't need that. And I threw that away somewhere along the line. Well, I, I think we marched for three days. And we'd stop at night. And they'd stop at an old farm barn or something like that. And we'd get into the barn, get out of the cold. But uh, we didn't have any food. They didn't feed us at all in those three days. And, <clears throat> of course, some of us had the sense to accumulate a little extra bread here and there uh, during we try to save uh, instead of eating a whole slice of bread we'd only eat a half slice and, and oh by the way that bread was made out of sawdust mm -hmm. and the dates on them were back in 1938 and this was in 45 so did you have any problems with uh Prisoners stealing from other prisoners? Or yes, we did. We did. We did have problems. One fellow stole some food from another fellow, and the sergeant in charge of the barracks, he um, uh, he took a, he says, fellas, we're going to have a kangaroo court. You're going to be the, the um, I'll be the judge, but you're going to be the jury. And um, they brought the fellow up on charges of stealing. And um, the sergeant in charge of our barracks, he said, dunk him in the... He didn't give him any, any excuses. Take him over to the latrine, the opening on the end, dunk him in right to his, to his uh, uh, chin. Just leave his head above that uh, water in a latrine. And, of course, that made him throw right up, he threw right up right away, see. And when you go into, well, it's, it's all uh, human manure mm -hmm. and like that, so. But it was a good example. I, we never had another one steal anything. And um, even though some fellows were very hungry and they just couldn't get used to not eating. And... Um, <coughs> Well, as I getting back to when we were walking, uh, we walked for about three days, and then we come on to a, a small town that had a had a, a, a bunch of uh, rail. It's a rail yard, like a like a um, commercial, uh, with boxcars there and everything. And um, the the sergeant that was leading us, he says, "We're going to get in these rail." It, getting these boxcars and we're going to go and we may not go today but we'll go sometime so we all got in and I don't know how many boxcars it was there but there, well there's 50,000 of us walking uh, as near as I could figure and um, we went um, we went on the boxcars and we got straight two or three times by planes finally the, the the engineer he must have stopped the train and ordered ordered everybody out and we we get down in the ditches on the side and the plane would come it was they were P-38s they'd come from that way we'd go over to that side of the ditch when they come from this way we'd go to this side of the ditch and we could see the pilot we could see the pilots right into the in the planes and uh, finally they stopped they stopped when he saw, they must have spotted us as American, American prisoners of war. See, so they stopped and went on, just like that. And uh, the last one, he, he wobbled his wings and he left. So uh, um, we got back in the boxcars and they took off again. Well, we finally ended up down in. Um, uh, well, we they called it Mark Pungo. Uh, and, and I can't remember the number of the camp, but it was down in Austria. It was east. It was east of Birch's Gardens because we worked in Birch's Garden one day, and it was east of Birch's Garden. And there was a little town and a dam and a power plant, and it was uh, this was just like the Catskills, the mountains come right down like that, and the valley probably was, we'll say, uh, 
it's three, three miles across with railroad tracks going and then the lake and the dam was right there and we were oh say we were probably two miles east of that and we used to have to go in there in that town and work and then when there was an air raid the the every time there was they tried to knock out that dam the the um, British and the English or uh, the British and the Americans and uh, the the sergeant that was a guard that was in charge of us, he's come on fellas, there's no no air raid shelters around here. We gotta go up on the mountain. It's an air raid coming. So we'd walk way up on the mountain. We'd probably be a thousand feet in the air. We sit there on the side of the hill, just like we'd all sit all all you know, spread out. Mm -hmm. We'd look right out and there's the plane right in front of us. Going right along. Bombay's open up. You could see the pilots see the co-pilots in them and and each each plane as it went by this ak ak going up at them and they they, they couldn't have been more than a thousand feet off the off the ground see and they'd blow that dam apart they'd blow the the power power plant apart they'd blow all the all the um tracks out and one day there was a there was a red cross train in there a German Red Cross, and they didn't bomb the tracks that day, because they on top of the tra on top of the the the, uh, the cars was a Red Cross painted, and so they did they didn't bomb that. The, they only went after the dam, the dam and the power plant. See, and we had to do that several times. So, but um, uh, then they would always take us back to camp. Well, you know, uh, that was getting that was getting into April, and you know it was getting a little little nicer weather, and and uh, when we didn't go into town like Sunday, uh, what do you do with yourself? So we try to clean ourselves up the best we could. You know, there was only one faucet for all the men in the compound, and uh, you'd. You know, you try to wash yourself up and clean yourself, wash your socks and clean them up and put them out to dry for a nice sunny day. You go, you, know, you just put your feet in your shoes, that's all. And uh, and then we take our pants off and we sit there and get the lice out of them. They, the lice would stay in all the seams, and, uh, which you couldn't help. They they just, uh, I, I felt, uh, I found out. If I take my pants off when I went to bed at night, I could sleep. But if I left my pants on, I couldn't sleep. So, uh, because the lice bite you all the time. And, um, and of course, you get bitten by lice, and they, they, that can kill you. Because they used to wheel the Russians out of that camp, uh, you know, stacked up like cordwood. They must have been uh, lousy as hell, you know. So, um... Um, we we still we went into we went into the the little town and worked there every almost every day except Sunday. But Sunday was, was when we used to lay out in the sun a lot of times. We'd look up on the mountain. You, you, you like looking right straight up. You could see the skiers up there, just little dots skiing around, skiing around on the top of that mountain. And uh, I said, well, they don't know war's on. <laughs> but, uh, well, it came near to the end of the war, and the um, word come down through somewhere uh, whether somebody had um, a secret radio that they were, they were going to... Um, they were going to um, uh, declare peace, and the war was over with in a couple of days. And uh, we, did, we, we, seeing was believing. But <coughs> well, one one morning we woke up, and there was no guards. They were all gone. We were free to do anything we wanted to do. We could go out of the out of the compound. So a few of us did go out. We went out and and went into that town that was right near us 
and there was a big army barracks there. And we found uh, in the cellar, one of the rooms we broke into, we found bag after bag and bags of sugar. We cut those bags open, took our shoes off, we wallered it, you know. We'd never had sugar at all. I filled my pockets with sugar. So then we went into town, we stole a, a, a van. We found a machine gun, we mounted it in the back end of the van. One guy stole a motorcycle, he put that in the back of the van. We went back. You gotta stop.